mission is to bring together top venture capitalists to compete so you have the insights on how the best VCs invest. All right, so uh, give a warm welcome and a round of applause to Ashley Aiden, Vamos Ventures. Ashley, this is Ashley's walk-up song. Give it, give it up for Ashley. It's so nice to be here today. Super excited to be next to this awesome uh, rank of panelists. I'm Ashley. I am an early stage investor at Vamos Ventures. We are a Latino and diverse focused fund. I'm doing a lot of impact oriented investing. When we talk about impact, it's things like affordability and access, uh, financial wealth generation, cleaner, better worlds, upskilling, reskilling. We do a lot of health and wellness, fintech, future of work, sustainability. I cover a lot of our healthcare and uh, fintech verticals. And it's great to be here in New York and seeing this growing ecosystem. Uh, next up, we got Jason Scott, Anum Fund. Hit the music for uh, Jason. He picked this out himself. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Jason Scott, um, founding partner at Anum. Uh, we are a global venture fund. We really focus on uh, technologies that are really supporting the movement of people, movement of goods, movement of money. So logistics, supply chain, fintech, prop tech, real estate tech, and just generally things that create economic opportunity across the world. Um, and Anything else you want me to say? No, that's it. That's it. Let's move on. I used on. to work here. Um, oh, yeah. We used to have AC, so sorry. <laughs> yeah, we're working on it. <laughs> Next up, uh, you all know Samantha Rodriguez with uh, Google for Startups Fund. You hit the Sam's music. You know me, uh, but just to reiterate, Google for Startups, Black and Latino Founders Fund. Super happy to be here uh, and excited to kick the show off. I won't lean in further. No. Uh, and last but not least, I should have gave him this belt to walk out with because he, he is a defending champ of primetime VC. Uh, and he is defending this belt right here. Uh, partner at Bessemer Venture Partners, Elliot Robinson. We're going to hit the music. I think he's in here. There he is. Can you hit the music for Elliot, please? And I'm going to give you time to run while rapidly peel. Uh, okay, I'm Elliot. Uh, nice to meet everyone. Um, I'm a partner at Bessemer Venture Partners. I've been in venture capital. I just started my 18th year. So as my wife likes to tell me, I have no transferable skills, and she's right. Um, <laughs> I lead the growth equity practice at Bessemer, which I started five years ago. Bessemer has been around a really long time. And the fun personal news and professional news is I'm moving back to New York in like a month. So I'll be back. Woo! OK, OK. Uh, let's just give a little context how this works, right? So we're going to ask these VCs uh, to debate a little bit today. And we have four questions for them. That is the first round. After every question, we put up a QR code and you all will vote for the winners of each general question. Uh, the one with the most, cu uh, most votes uh, get make it to the finals, so the two make it to the finals, so don't be hurt if you don't make it to the finals. It's all right. We'll, we'll keep you around for banter. Um, but that is, that is what we got. Uh, so let's, let's just get this going. And you see the title belt, so they'll have a nice speech, whoever wins this title belt. So the first question, we're going to start off right here, and it's a macro question macro question so ai buzz can't save the startup fund fundraising numbers pitchbook is predicting q2 of 2023 posting the lowest quarterly total in more than three quarters across seed and growth stage rounds question is what's your opinion on why so many investors continue to be on the sidelines we don't like that as founders uh, and just give us a little bit of the state of funding fundraising right now so jason kick us off you've been here 18 years. He's been doing this for 18 years. Um, so I think, I mean, a couple things. I would say, first and foremost, someone told me a long time ago that investors never get um, uh, fired for the deals they don't do. They only get fired for the deals that they do, right? And I think, ultimately, there's a lot of upstream pressures. A lot of LPs, um, especially newer LPs to this asset class, are a little bit um, weary. Um, and so I think for emerging managers who are, who are still raising capital, it's been a little bit tough. And so they don't necessarily have that dry powder. And I think for the people who do have the dry powder, a couple things. Um, I know personally, we're reserving some for our founders just to make sure the ones we have already invested in are able to survive this climate. And I think secondarily, I think there's still a lot of uncertainty, right? Like uh, in terms of what's going to happen over the next 12 months. And so to your point, I'm not going to start investing just because of the AI hype, right? I'm going to start investing when I feel like I'm making so solid investments. So. Ashley, what do you think here? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of drop off, there's been a 19% drop off in, in deal numbers, right, versus the first half of last year. And so I think it's pretty dire out there. Um, and call me more of a pessimist, but the IPO markets have dried up. Um, you know, you're seeing n hardly any deal volume and liquidity out there in the markets. People are on the sidelines. And, you know, looking at the past 40 years of IPO history, it usually takes one to three years. And so that doesn't just affect later stage investors. It trickles down to early stage investors. And we're all on the sidelines saying, well, how are these companies going to exit? What is that going to look like? What are the milestones and KPIs look like to really grow and scale these companies? I do also think you see a lot of funds that have raised in 2020 and 2021 with all this dry powder, as you mentioned, that are on the sidelines being a little more op opportunistic and saying, well, the next thing I'm going to invest in better be the best thing since sliced bread, or at least what they think is going to be. Um, and then, you know, you mentioned a really great point, which is a lot of investors are also on the sidelines just knees deep with their portfolio companies trying to support them and make them survive over these next few months. You know, I do think you'll probably see a little bit of a bloodbath in 4Q, and then hopefully I'm optimistic for a pickup back in uh, 2024, early 2024. Elliot, what do you think here? So I'm going to take a little bit of a different angle to it. Um, I like that. There was a time earlier in my career where you did like one or two deals a year, and that was venture capital. And then this thing happened, which was, um, we don't call out peers by name, but there was a fund named after an animal you might find in the desert or on safari. <laughs> and then they changed everything. And there was another corporate fund out of Japan, maybe, that changed everything. And then we all found ourselves in a place where we're doing like five or six deals a year. And now they're gone. Or well, they've reduced their investing. So when you think about just the quantum of dollars that they were putting to work and the speed by which they were doing deals, there were companies that would raise their Series A, Series B, and Series C in like nine months. That's not traditional venture capital. So while it is obviously a drop off, um, I think we're kind of getting back to normal of what venture capital was for 20, 30 years, which I'm really glad to see happen. I'll say one thing on kind of the, the AI hype. It is a bit of a hype cycle. And as we know, it goes up, comes down, and then it becomes steady state. There's a lot of data that's come out in the last 30 days about everything from stability AI, from DALI from ChatGPT, and we're finding what steady state looks like. So a lot of investors are waiting on the sidelines to see what does engagement with new AI native tools actually look like at steady state. And then I think you're even starting to see now some of the investment pace picking back up because we know what growth rate looks like. And people don't want to be stuck in that place where we were post-COVID where everything shot up, people invested and companies were valued as if it would always shoot up, and then people went back outside. And that's kind of what's happening uh, in the AI hype cycle as well. All right, Sam, do you agree, disagree? Where are you at on this? I feel your eyes saying create something. Create that, the tension. Just, just, create the drama. Create, create the tension. Um, so I think plus one to what a lot of you know, everyone said on the panel, but I do want to kind of go back to the question a little bit and bring back in the AI lens, which you touched on a little bit too, Elliot. I, I almost want to separate the questions a little bit, right? I think that you've got this um, trend right now from an investment perspective, and then you've got what's happening in AI. And the reason why I want to separate the two is because at the top la layer, I do agree, there's this higher risk aversion, right, within the investment space. But then when you take those investors who have a higher risk aversion and you put them in this AI realm, which I would split into for the sake of this conversation, two categories, right? You've got founders that are building what I would call businesses that are AI disruptors, where AI is a core part of their product and service, AI first. The second category I would bucket it into is AI augmented, right? So your retail company, it's still retail, but it has a layer of AI in it that's making the business more efficient. The reason why I would bucket into those two categories is because I do think that the AI first companies are seeing an uptick in investment. And if you look at the trends of AI, right, we probably, it's been around for a long time. Google loves to say we've been doing this since 2015 with DeepMind. Um, but I think if you look at the recent trend, the uptick really happened you know, earlier this year. And so I think that next quarter, I'd predict, we'd see a lot of those AI first companies come out with their deal news. And then you've got that second category of AI augmented, which is more of a vertical, I'm sorry, a horizontal, if you will. AI has a horizontal across various industries that is still seeing that risk aversion and still seeing some of that difficulty in the investment space. Um, so that's my nuanced approach to it. So it's a yes or no answer. Yes, investors are sitting on the sidelines for certain elements of AI that AI augmented side, but I do think that there's a cohort of investors that are really leaning in on that AI first category. A lot of knowledge dropped here. I think this is pretty good so far. I like this. So 
we're going to do a little test round, right? So now we're doing a little vote. So now you are going to scan this QR code. It's going to bring you to Slido. Mel, you could vote too if you want. A anybody in here, you're welcome to vote. Anybody with we a camera? Vote? Yeah, it's fine. Extra, extra vote for yourself? It's all right. I do some voting sometimes too, depending on you know, who's giving a little spice to their answers. Would that be public, Charlie? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. It's, don't worry about that. Fudging numbers a little bit. Uh, do we miss anything on here? Does, does anyone disagree? Uh, you know, got about a minute or so. Maybe steal the the answer, but nothing here. All right. So this is uh, usually the first round's a little bit of a we'll call it a popularity contest. You guys are getting used to this voting system. You know, maybe it's your first time here. And we're still waiting to trickle in. So, Mel, can you show us the uh, the results here? Samantha, I won. I told you a popularity oh. contest, right? First, I'm, I'm, me. It helps to be the sponsor. Yeah, right, right. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Mark those words, everyone. I'm Burn. Kidding. I'm kidding. He's that's good. Kidding. We got 71 votes in, so that's that's good activity. All right, so we're gonna move on to the next question, but I think you guys got the hang of it. I will say the more drama, the more that you guys disagree, the better the banter. And I, you know, I strongly encourage the ones that kind of go against the grain, I guess, so to speak. But uh, let's go with the second question here. This is for our founders, uh, founders type of question, right? So what are your expectations or more most important takeaways that you'd like to cover on an intro call with a founder pitching their company? Uh, again. Anything unique would be nice, too. Uh, so let's start off with Ashley. What are you looking to sure. get out of that intro call? I'm really big on team, and I don't just mean like multiple times founder, deep functional experience. I mean distance traveled, and this may be like my Puerto Rican Turkish first gen college student hustle mentality, but I'm very much like, you know, what's your story? Like, where do you come from? Tell me about all the hardships that you face to build this, because building a company is really freaking hard. And you could be, you know, at a really cushy finance job instead. So I like to see that, and I like to talk about it and see where people are coming from. Um, you know, I also, and this is a little nuance for Vamos Ventures, we're impact-oriented investors, right? So I want to, like, get in their minds and see, well, is there mission alignment and chemistry on that angle? You know, are you thinking about that 30% of the population in the United States is gonna be Latino in a few short years, right? And from a healthcare perspective, which is what I cover, are you thinking about things like cultural competency and you know the patient that's ever changing? And the more boring, I think, answer to this question is like the vision and the scalability of this business model. And um, this may be a little controversial as well, but we're very much, and I'm very much a believer that you could have impact and financial returns at the same time. And we wanna make sure, and I wanna make sure that the founders aligned in that. Okay. Okay. Uh, Elliot, what do you got here? Yeah, for sure. So I think the biggest takeaway I want to hear in a first pitch, even second pitch, as we go into deeper diligence is how customer obsessed are you? I think one of the biggest problems is people want to tell you about their technology, their product, why it's differentiated. But then the question is, are you like a hammer looking for a nail or have you really identified where the nail is? Or are you scoping a hammer to knock it out of the park? It's the biggest mistake. If you dedicate a slide or 60 seconds to tell about your startup from the customer journey and the pain points and how you're alleviating those pain points or adding value to that customer journey, then I know you will have that same customer obsession flow throughout of your team because you're building the company, you're building the product roadmap, you're building customer success with that same you know, customer empathy in mind. And I think so many times people focus on the technology itself or that technical differentiation, but don't even understand what the customer is really going through and what's ultimately going to make them take some incumbent or homegrown, home-built solution and then put your little, you know, 10-person company solution in and trust that their business is going to run on your stack. I think it's one of the biggest things that's overlooked. Sam, intro founder call. What are you looking for? He took my answer. Um, no, I, I definitely echo that sentiment around being customer obsessed. Uh, I used to be actually at a startup where my role was specifically focused on customer success. I think it's super important. Uh, but I would add to that in the sense that, um, I kind of would even zoom out perhaps further with a founder of what is your why, right? So yes, you're customer obsessed, but 
what got you here in the first place? What's going to keep you excited, keep you driven when there are really down times? Because that's going to be the majority of them. When I was at a startup, we slept in the office some nights just to make sure that things didn't break overnight because we were manually hitting buttons to make sure our post discharge phone calls didn't go out. And so it really is about what is your why, right? Is this a larger you know, mission-oriented piece from your journey, where you're from, your family, um, maybe just you know, an experience you had over the years? So really digging into what's going to get them going and keep them excited and keep them you know, going through those, getting through those harder times, uh, which will be you know, more often than not in the beginning, I think is super important. So. Jason, what do you got here? Yeah, um, well, I always start by asking them their superhero origin story, but that's because I'm obsessed with superheroes. But what I, I often think, and those of you who have sat, some of you have sat through me doing OKR workshops in the past, but founders are scientists in labs, right? I come from a life sciences background. So you have to really understand, okay, what is the hypothesis you're testing? How are you, what metrics are gonna lead you to validating or invalidating that hypothesis so I can understand how you're using my capital, right? So I want you to be able to really prioritize, okay, here's our hypothesis. We're using this capital right now to run this experiment. If we validate the hypothesis, hypothesis we're gonna put more fuel in that fire. If our hypothesis is wrong, we're gonna abort mission and we're gonna move away from that and test a different hypothesis, right? And so I like to think, or look for founders that have that kind of scientific mindset. Um, because I think that is the best way to be both 10x thinkers and moonshot thinkers, but also very capital efficient with, their, with my capital and their capital and their time, honestly. Okay, okay. Jason, what is uh, your superhero that you, you, you most closely connect with? I like with? that. We got the voting up, the QR codes closely are Closely connect with? I mean, Britney everyone Spears. wants to be... Britney, oh, yeah. Do not closely connect with Britney Spears. I, um, I would actually say... I mean, I don't know what this says about me. I'm like Wolverine because I want to live a long time, maybe. I used right. to, when I was five years old, I used yeah. to say I'm going to live to 125, which I think is possible now. Back in the day, it was like a little questionable. Right. Um, and like the ability to like, you know, survive stuff, okay. like right. skydive. Ellie, you look like you got something to say. You, you uh, jumping in here? Did I, we miss I'm, I'm actually not that much into comic books or superheroes. I, if I'm being honest, my superhero is going to sound corny. It's my dad. Um, so my, okay, all right, okay. We got some awes and some but laughter. This is I'll, not a part of the voting. I will, this is not. No, this is not because the QR code is up right now. Brownie's just not a part of the voting. Um, I, I will show. use 15 seconds to tell the story. So uh, my parents were part of the first integrated class at Vanderbilt, which is always weird to say because, like, that wasn't that long ago. It was my parents. Uh, my dad was the first black person to get a math degree at Vanderbilt. He worked at Westinghouse as a computer scientist for eight years before spitting out with two other black computer scientists to start an enterprise software company. So what you don't see on my LinkedIn is seven years of unpaid forced child labor at my dad's startup. Um, and that's where I get my passion for working with uh, founders and entrepreneurs. So as a kid, that's where I learned how to program anyone who knows MS-DOS, anyone? Sierra Games, old, I'm old. Um, but that's that's really where I think about founder superpower. I know Squarespace, so I'm pretty good at that. You know, it's all right. Can we see the results on this, Mel? Please. All right, Elliot, taking it. There we go. Now we're mixing it up. This is pretty good. All right, this is good. You guys are excited. I see that smiling right there. That's good. All right. Next question: State of the cloud, Elliot. This is probably a question you're going to start off with, right? State of the cloud. Uh, what? is the impact AI is having on cloud computing industry, and what is the future of the cloud, given that you do a little bit of cloud work and state of the cloud? You know, why don't you kick us off on this? So the state of the cloud is in flux, and it's the most exciting time to be a cloud investor across the stack. Um, application layer, pass layer, infrastructure layer. I'm spending most of my time on infrastructure and pass layer, um, it's not that our firm isn't spending time on the SaaS layer, we certainly are, uh, but for me, I have never seen in my entire career this much venture capital going after infrastructure. Now, I have a lot of my portfolio companies that run on GCP, AWS, Azure, but for the first time we have not just startups but big enterprises running on companies that you may or may not heard of called CoreWeave or FluidStack. Um, you know, Jensen, people are retrofitting all of the crypto mining for any, you know, long crypto people. Let me tell you what's actually happening. <laughs> We're retrofitting a lot of that GPU power towards AI specific and AI native use cases. And that's totally disrupting. At the same time, 
where a lot of the large hyperscalers, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, are in a bit of flux with their own core business just because it's macroeconomic disruption. So like the marriage of that unique cocktail is unlike anything I've ever seen. So all the cool chat GPT stuff that goes viral on Twitter, I just kind of like cover my eyes to that because what's happening is you have to reimagine the entire stack from the bottoms up to really uh, bleed into what's happening with AI over the next decade. And I've never seen anything like this because these big companies have had a stranglehold over cloud computing for so long. I, I've just never been this excited about it. Exciting times. We're going to keep coming down, Sam. Cannot agree more. Um, I feel like overnight, the Google Cloud just team, it just went insane, right? The inbox just blew up. Um, and then we launched an AI program in a matter of weeks. So it could not agree more. It's a whole new world for cloud. Um, what I would add to that, though, is I think just bringing it back to perhaps what I would say or, or speculate was the genesis for this spike in AI again, right, in recent months. And I think that is due to there being a need, right, for three things. The first is I think there was this tension around talent within cloud, just building infrastructure, needing engineers. I think the second thing is there is a huge need for compute power. Uh, still an issue, probably one of the biggest uh, problems that I hear startup founders talk about when we're discussing their infrastructure and building on GCP. And then I'd say the third category is efficiency, right? How can we be more efficient as a company, but how can our infrastructure also be more efficient as being probably, for a lot of companies, their biggest line item that they pay for? Um, and so in light of that, I think that just ultimately cloud will, because of AI coming to the fold, it is becoming more efficient. It is focused on compute power. It is right making things more automated so that talent isn't having as much of attention anymore. So that's the current state and maybe the more immediate future. I think looking past that, though, what Ellie pointed out is also something that um, I'm seeing happening where you have all these other players coming in. And I think that GCP is um, really excited by this and tons of other big tech companies are too talking about it where there may be a future where there will need to be more of this multimodal right approach to startups and seeing how startups might be kind of, kind of coming into the fold to build multimodal platforms that will help us in managing all of these incredible bustling startups that are coming out now in the infrastructure place uh, or space. And I think that uh, big tech firms, specifically just anyone focused on cloud, will have to put some skin in the game too. So those are my two predictions for very far out. Nice. Jason, what are you thinking here? On the yeah, I think what make I mean, obviously, all those things are exciting as as a uh, someone whose personal net worth is invested in a cloud company. But I think <laughs> ultimately, like what makes me really excited is honestly the accessibility of it. I loved that, for instance, GCP recently um, is now accessible to founders. I met a lot of founders at, when I was in um, Marrakesh the other day, and they were from Pakistan who have not traditionally had access to technologies like GCP. So they haven't been able to build using these AI tools and these AI platforms. And so I love the accessibility of it. Um, we invest a lot in Sub-Saharan Africa. And it's really awesome to see um, not only are they um, bringing the technologies, but Google, and I'm, I don't know if the other companies are doing this, but opening up these AI hubs in Ghana, right? And being able to bring not all the things that you just said, but to populations who have not traditional, traditionally had access to the tools, the, the um, job opportunities that you just mentioned. And also, the, it's so awesome to now see our, some of these farmers that we're um, building, uh, not my, I'm not building, my founders are building FinTech tools for in Nigeria, now have, be able to use these AI models on their devices that they have not been able to do in the past. So for me, what's really exciting is the accessibility of it um, and how it's now becoming not just a, something that we're all privileged enough to have access to. And I think a plug for your fund, which invests globally. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Plug for Anim, all right, Ashley. <laughs> um, when I used to think of cloud, I used to think of like hardware racks in specific location, and now it's about data and leveraging the data, right, and accessibility and making workloads distributed, and that's what's really exciting to me as it relates to sort of AI as well. It's, um, you know, when I think about sort of the healthcare context specifically, it's user experience. We have a company, Botcode.ai, that was just announced today. Ooh. Google Latino Founders Fund funded them, uh -huh. and what they're building Building is um, is a chat bot, right? That um, is the interface of if you're going to a doctor's office and you're like, well, do you take my insurance? And like, what's this doctor's rating? And it's just so seamless. Um, when I think about sort of you know cloud and AI and like the future of healthcare, I get really excited about personalized healthcare because there's so much data and caring for folks in more specific ways and doctors becoming agile and that that's what really gets me pumped. No, I was going to say, and then I think on the other end of the spectrum, something that gets me worried, obviously, is with all this data being in the cloud, like making sure that someone is innovating to make sure that data is secure, uh, making sure that we're able to make sure that um, 
as, as all of the consumer data, as all of you are using Bard and ChatGPT all the time, you're putting so much information into the cloud that people are making sure that we're protecting that user data and protecting that consumer data. Okay, all right. Absolutely. And I think um, to add to that responsibly, just thinking about responsibility ethics is going to be a massive, I think, um, massively prioritized item as well for cloud. Given we have so many pre-seed, seed type, maybe A companies in here, I mean, related to that that stage, I mean, do you have any thoughts on the cloud and how you're seeing the ex you know this explosion, how many percentage, you know, what's going up, what's going down? Um, so I think for early founders, um, this is, we did not plan this, but a plug for our credits program, which if you are backed by a VC of any kind, C to Series A, then you're eligible for up to 150K in credits for Google Cloud. If you're AI first, 250 credits in year one. Um, so I would say as a founder, whether it's Google Cloud or any other program out there, look for ways you can experiment using these credit programs utilize their resources, right? Really try and figure out what you want to build and then go. And I think that experimentation and leveraging these credits is super important. I understand experimentation can be expensive. So if you're early and you can really lean into these credits programs, even if it's a multi-cloud approach, try things out and um, really look for those programs and, and apply. That would be my call out. Yeah, um, earlier this year I led the Series A in a company called Coactive uh, out of the Bay. Um, it's all about unstructured data and what's happening with image and generative AI and video data and really how do we know what it means and what does it say about your business and if you're thinking about what's happening in the cloud for again for the first time you have startups that are putting AI specific infrastructure like bare metal into the market like that's just not a thing so for 15 years the typical playbook was find a hyperscaler partner with them take their credits and then build on top of them. But right now, there's an opportunity for you to find even more cost-effective ways to partner with the Lambda Labs, with the Core Weave. Not the, I'm not invested in these companies. I'm just giving them a shout out. And I think more competition means there's more options and more leverage for founders, where you don't have to partner with the same three names every time. Obviously, I'm a big fan of Google and GCP, okay. just right. to be clear. <laughs> um, right. But I'm really excited about all the opportunities that that brings and then these new companies on the infrastructure side will partner with AI native companies that are looking for infrastructure partners to build with and on top of. So it'll create new business development opportunities that I don't think we've seen because sometimes going through the hyperscalers just can be tough because your small company that might generate a million or two million in your first year, it just might not move Google's PL or Microsoft's PL, but it might really move the PL of one of these startups that's still, you know, sub $50 million ARR, and they'll do a lot to partner to scale your business because it'll scale their business and workloads as well. Super helpful. You, yeah. Sam, you got something else before we... Very quickly, yeah. I think um, in terms of building responsibly, though, General Catalyst actually put out this really interesting, what they're calling a manifesto. Um, it's not that as long as it sounds, but would highly encourage you guys to look at that and just read through it about how to build responsibly in AI. And I think that that's super important, and, and they um, wrote a great piece on it. So, Mel, can we see the results for question number three? All right, Elliot taking that one. Yeah, he's, he's a little seasoned in this. Yeah, let's give it up for Elliot. I mean, you guys don't have to be too quiet. It seems like the AC is coming on. I don't know if you're feeling it. Maybe it's in my head. I'm losing my mind. Something. It's very exciting up here that we got some AC. <laughs> very exciting. All right, last question of the first round before we move on and cut two people, cut two VCs. It's nice, right? Flip it a little bit instead of a pitch contest. I don't, hey, I'm not a power guy. It's all right. Don't worry about it. All right, what action or inaction is actually moving the needle on driving more dollars to diverse founders and funders? What should LPs and VCs double down on? This is a question from Fernando Montefort, Montefiorte. Is he here? Fernando, thank you for that. Appreciate you. Um, Sam, I think you were going to kick this one off. Sure. I love this question. Um, I think it's a matter of rising tide. I'm bad at these phrases. Rising tide raises all boats. Is that the what's the phrase? Yep, that's why we're here. That's right? what we're, here. we're doing. We're doing that right exactly. now. Exactly. I think that, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that it isn't just one thing, and it isn't just one part of the ecosystem. It's LPs, it's VCs, it's founders, it's even educators, right? And just making sure that we are constantly thinking about and talking about it, right, that this space needs more diversity and how can we go about it. I think for founders, you know, 
encouraging them to not be afraid to build, to go out and take risks. Um, and always just as if you're a founder yourself, right, bringing more folks into the fold for VCs. I think thinking about your biases, whether you're an emerging fund, amazing, that's your focus area, but even going into the VCs where that might not be a focus area for their fund as a whole, that's not their mission. Um, they're investing more broadly. I think um, challenging them to look outside their biases, outside their circles for deal flow, for you know, folks that are going to talk to them about what trends are important, right? Because different demographics also come with different challenges, which is why I think a lot of problems for demographics that may not have investors in those spaces don't necessarily see startups come out and solve those problems in the first place. Um, and then for LPs, I think, again, same thing, right? Looking for folks to bring into the fold to join you in this LP journey. Um, and as you're chatting with your VCs, recognizing that diversity is important. Um, the same way that you want to diversify your portfolio, whether it's on stocks or what have you, it's super important to have diverse perspectives across the board. So I think it's just all folks have to lean in. Yeah. Jason, what are you seeing that's actually moving the needle? Yeah, I mean, part of the reason I moved to New York from Palo Alto is, is just how much of a bubble it is. And I just remember seeing some of my business school classmates that literally would walk across the street and raise like $10 million on like a napkin idea. And I think for me, it's all about going upstream. And something I've been incredibly passionate about is just teaching more people the asset class that actually do have some sort of wealth that they can actually help seed some of these founders. And as I mentioned earlier, people, founders have to have the freedom to experiment, but you can't experiment if you don't have any sort of access to capital and support in your network, right? And so this whole like family and friends concept, um, a lot of us don't have those family and friends, but through, for instance, entities like, I don't wanna do a plug, but started this entity called the Black Angel Group, teaching people who actually have now finally come into some wealth through working in tech, of this asset class of, of entrepreneurship and early state venture, and now getting us to be able to invest into those founders, because we're naturally gonna be biased to invest in what is familiar, and so folks within our network or people that we have shared experience, experiences with. So the more upstream you can, the more diversity you can make upstream, I think the more it will just trickle down. Ashley, action or inaction that you're seeing moving the needle? Listen, I think that at the end of the day, you can't make people who don't care care. That's unfortunately why we have 3% of venture dollars going to black and brown founders and just a little more going to female founders. And so I think about, well, how do we maximize on the people who actually care. And they could be you know, black and brown, they could be other people who care. Um, something that was really impactful for me in my career was a program called Pledge LA. Pledge LA is this wonderful program in Los Angeles that have different stakeholders, government, uh, foundations, venture capitalists, and they place undergrad and graduate students of color at these different places over the summer. So I was placed at Vamos Ventures, lo and behold. And I learned the ins and outs of venture capital, so much so that I, had skills to then have offers at other VC funds, but ultimately, because of the mission alignment, ended up at Vamos Ventures, and I felt prepared. And I think it's more of people like us being in investment decision-making roles that can move actual capital and dollars, that's gonna make a difference. I agree with the LP side as well. We need more diversity on the LP side, because I don't know about y'all, but I go into these rooms and I see the same faces on the other side, and I'm like, why hasn't this changed? Why have it, this is still a black box for a lot of diverse emerging managers, and that shouldn't be the case. And on the deal side, a lot of what I think about is early stage to later stage. And a lot of founders who are diverse don't know what it takes to get to C or B or A. And a lot of what I'm trying to do is connect more to like growth stage investors to then inform founders. Here's what it's going to take. And hopefully we can support going upstream, building wealth, having these founders exit that then gets funneled back into the communities that we care about so that they be can become angel investors so that they can go out and build funds and be really awesome people that enrich and diversify the startup ecosystem. Yeah, it's pretty simple for me. Um, you know, the real tricky thing about this whole venture capital industry is the whole capital part. You can venture in to do a bunch of things, but if you have no capital, like you're missing a big piece of it. Um, so I always think about like, how do we go back to the source? So if you just think about like, state pension funds, which is actually where a large number of the dollars that my fund and many of the funds manage comes from. And if you just look at like California, for example, small state, um, <laughs> the majority of the people that work state jobs that then create the pension dollars that are allocated to alternative asset managers, it's less than one-tenth of one percent. 
that are put back into people that look like the folks that create the dollars in the first place. Mm -hmm. Like, just think about that stat. We're never gonna get there unless that changes. Um, so for me, um, behind the scenes, what I spend the majority of my time on is trying to get at the state level, even a little bit at the federal level on the Hill, getting us to reimagine the definition and the application of the Emerging Manager Program, because it's holding us back. Um, the, the person I often think about the most when I have this conversation is Charles Hudson, who's like an OG of the Emerging Manager game, but what is he emerging from? <laughs> like, he's been doing this longer than most of us. Like, what is he emerging from? Why is he still forced to go speak to LPs where now his fund, where he is, doesn't fit that program? And if you go right into the like fine print on the Emerging Manager program, there's this thing called Roman numeral, which means if you're a fund one manager, two manager, sometimes three manager, you can qualify as an Emerging Manager. And it's a loophole to then not have female-led or people of color-led funds be able to raise that capital, and then it doesn't even go. It's earmarked for a thing, and then they ship it out through this back door. So. I'm not advocating for getting rid of the program, but it needs to be redefined and reimagined, and I think that will have the biggest impact on the entire ecosystem. Yeah. I think though, or were you? No, no, you gotta go. No, I was gonna say, but I think, I don't know, maybe I'm just more cynical, but I just don't think that those institutions are going to, especially in macroeconomic environments like this, like actually like change. And so I actually, I think it has to be at the individual level, honestly, and like that is why I think just teaching people more about this asset class because I think there are a lot of people who actually do have that are black and brown etc but that that do have some ability to invest in this asset class that just don't know anything about it right I, I talked to VPs at Google who literally are like I'm still just investing in Google because I don't know I don't know what angel investing is I don't know like what is the risk profile when do I get returns like how does it even work what is a safe right and so I think like educating some of those people so that we can get more momentum because I Again, I'm pretty cynical, but I just don't think that these institutions are going to like um, all of a sudden do the right thing. Um, I, I believe it would make them more money, but I don't think they believe that it would make them more money. Yeah, I think the last thing, um, maybe emerging of the of the statements here, um, respectfully disagree. I think that uh, yeah, <laughs> I think this is your the QR you. codes up right now this too. Is for you. Oh, Sam, keep going. I am Sam. disagreeing. Keep going, um, Sam. No, I, I think also Ashley said too. Right, you can't make them care, and so I, I also disagree with that. And I, I well, you can't make them care. Yes, but I think um, I had a great chat with a founder actually, Erica Brodnock, who wrote this fantastic book. She's one of our Black Founders Fund recipients out of EMEA, and she wrote this book about the UK specifically. But I think a lot of her theories also trickle down here, um, and maybe speaks to a little bit what, what you're talking about too. Elliot, where yes, we can't make people care, but we can definitely zoom in on individuals with power and try to educate them about the numbers that we already have, right? We don't need more numbers to prove that diverse founders do amazing things. We don't need the numbers to prove that emerging funds that are led by women and people of color are incredible, right? We have them. It's about, I think, educating the people in power and still with all of this capital, to Elliot's point, about what they can do with it and the incredible you know, founders and emerging funds that are out there already, so. Something just really quickly that I didn't appreciate about this whole LP landscape, and I'll never forget it, a manager told me, he was like, you better know the politicians and the states in the room because they're the ones who have the real big money to make this thing a really big platform. And I'm like, wait, I don't even like politics, but you know what, I'm gonna start hanging out with those people because they're the ones that have the big dollars. And so plus one on, on what you said before, I really do believe that. Are there any other accelerators or anything else that could help this community out uh, that's changing the, you know? I, I'm just gonna speak on that. We are over accelerated, underfunded. Yes. So like, yeah. I don't wanna yes. venture into another accelerator. I'd really like to just venture into funding and wiring of yes. money. And you know, as a member of Black VC who does Breaking Into Venture program, um, I, I too do agree that we need more people to understand the practice of venture capital, but what a shame it would be to educate a hundred new great underfunded black venture capitalists that have no access to the whole capital thing mm -hmm. that I started with. Like, you can't do venture capital without the second part. So, um, you know, I think both are the right answer. I think that's, that's the honest truth. But if we don't solve the access to capital part, we'll be back here year after year having the same panel conversation. And if we don't change it, then I think we failed, quite frankly. And just the last thing I'll say on this is I Cuts feel... Cuts coming, so get, get as <laughs> much in as you want. You got a couple more here. minutes to cut yeah, comments. Yeah, I'm very passionate about all up here. Um, 
Unfortunately, I do find, and I'm curious what, what the rest of the panel thinks, is there's also this sense of there's not a lot of room for all of us, and it's so unfortunate of a dynamic because there is room for all of us, and that's how we all grow together, is working together and telling the ins and outs and secrets of fundraising and LPs and, you know, and, and how to succeed in this business. So that's something that I just want to see more of, and it's unfortunate that that's a dynamic in this space. Yeah, and I think it comes from, we go, like, I went to an event on Monday, right, um, that Insight Partners was hosting for underrepresented mm -hmm. fund managers, and we are effectively all competing for these same pools of money um, from these LP, the few LPs that are deploying. So I think yeah, yeah. that's the unfortunate part. The com competition is created around us versus sure. um, um, it being an innate or natural thing. But. Well, before we show the results and Gene is tabulating the, the winners to move on to the finals, I will say Fidelity is going to be hosting a partner's get together private so that you guys can all share LPs that are actually investing in this. So we'll be doing that with uh, Nahal at ENIAC in the fall. So I'll be sure to invite all of you and keep you in the loop. So let's just see who won this round, not who's moving on to the finals. Elliot, you got it. It's close though. So there's a lot of votes and I'm sure it seems like it seems like Elliot made it to the finals. I'm going to just going to guess that potentially, but I'm going to look at my phone and Gene has given me the answers and who's made it to the finals. Suspense. He loves this. I mean, I know I didn't, so it's fine. <laughs> Jason, Jason, you didn't make it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 0 for 4. It's fine. Sorry. One day. One day Ash I'll get the belt. Ashley, I'm sorry. Sam, you made it to the finals with Elliot, so let's oh. give it up for our finalists sitting oh. next to each other. All right. All right. First question. Many of our attendees today are founders or early stage startup operators. What are some of the habits you've recognized that the most successful early stage founders do. Sam, go ahead. All right. Um, we cover customer obsessed, which is definitely important, and not necessarily habit, but I think important nonetheless. Uh, I think habit, I will bring this back to my early stage operator days, where my first day, this was post-graduating college, I showed up to the startup gig, um, and it was nine of us, and I was in a full suit. And everyone was very confused, as you can probably imagine. Um, and the first thing that one of the founders said is, I feel like you're going to need to see this message that we all really live by as it, on this team of, of nine. And it was this massive, uh, just very, you know, just thrown together sign that said better done than perfect. And that stuck with me for a long time. At first I was like, absolutely not. It's gotta be perfect. We need everything, T like I's dotted, T's crossed. But um, after building the company with that team and seeing us, you know, just do amazing things together, that always stuck with me of it really is about being better done than perfect um, and just getting things done quickly out the door. You know, the industry that we were in was healthcare, and so things were not moving as fast, but fast enough where we did need to get quick, get these contracts signed quickly, right? Move through things quickly, build quickly, and I think that better done than perfect was the motto I needed to hear to do that, and I see some incredible founders also bringing that back to me. Um, I actually had a founder say that to me before I even shared this was a mission that I, or a statement that I believed in, um, and it was just an incredible to hear. You sure you didn't put that on like yeah. a TechCrunch interview or something like that? No. I'm like, ah, this is my favorite quote too. But yeah. Yeah. Good quote. Yeah, and my team at Google too. Also, we yeah. believe in that as well. So if my email has spelling errors, that's why. Okay, Elliot. <laughs> uh, a couple of quick habits, uh, but start with a philosophy. So, um, I believe that the magic in your startup is going to be found in chasing the things that you don't want to do, uh, because as founders, you have these superpowers that come very natural to you. It's why you're a founder. What you're doing as a startup founder is kind of crazy when you think about it but you've found this thing, like I have the superpower to go do this crazy stuff, and then there's all this other annoying stuff that I don't wanna do, but the magic of your startup and it's scaling and operation and efficiency is gonna be found in you really going into the stuff that you don't wanna do, so that's a philosophy. In terms of habits, um, I give every founder I invest in or even get to know uh, the same book. It's a book called When Breath Becomes Air, um, it's about a cancer research doctor who ultimately gets diagnosed with terminal cancer. Yeah. And it's a book about how do you think about your relationship with time. Yeah. And as a founder, you're never going to have enough time to accomplish what you want to accomplish. But that book helps you, you know, assess your relationship with time, what matters, what's important, and prioritize. Obviously, prioritizing is the most important thing you can do because your to-do list is more than the amount of time that you have. Two last ones. Uh, I don't invest in founders who haven't thought about their values. I think anyone who knows me knows that 
values are super important to me. If it's not something that's core to you, I'll pass, even if the numbers say that it's the right thing to do, because you'll have 100 decisions to make every month, five will matter, and then if I don't know your value set, we're gonna have a real misalignment as an investor and board member on how to do those things. I wanna know that out of the gate, because I'm pretty sure I know the tough decisions uh, that you're gonna have to face. And then the last one, and most important, is can you let go? Um, scaling your business only happens if you're willing to let go and delegate to really smart people that sometimes you don't even trust. Like, that's the hardest part. You're gonna hire people that you know, and you're gonna hire some people that you don't necessarily know that well. The question is, can you let go and preserve more time for those superpowers? And the, the founders that can't will never reach their full potential, in my experience. Totally. And I, I'd add one more, just as hearing Elliot chat through that, jog my memory a bit too, about just some of the incredible founders that I've had a chance to meet. Um, I would also say, just really being self-aware Right, knowing where your strengths are and knowing where they aren't and being okay and mature enough to say that you don't have strengths in those areas and hiring accordingly. I think that is super important. Um, don't try to do it all. Doesn't mean that you necessarily always need a co-founder. I have a separate theory on that, but I do think that it's super important to know what you're good at and what you're not good at. And um, I think that that plays a role into delegation, but also into building the right team, which I think is super important in the early days, like first 10 hires crucial. Uh, so knowing who you need and why is important as well. So. All right. We're going to hold off on voting till the end for the finals. Um, so the second question in the finals, what is an investment trend or vertical that you believe in that others don't? Elliot, start us here. This is my favorite question because uh, we try to be contrarians even inside the firm. Um, if I were to stand up in front of all of my partners and pitch something, uh, we're big cloud SaaS investors at Bessemer. Uh, I think my slide would say, on-prem software, which is crazy. But I think we're like approaching this weird time where we spent 20 years building cloud infrastructure and throwing everything in the cloud, and that's awesome. There's like all the benefits, we all know about it. However, in this new AI-first world, there are some really good use cases for building and deploying on-prem. And as a cloud investor, like that's somewhat controversial, but it's just the truth. And I'm seeing it more and more. So not even hybrid, but just on-prem. Um, and I think we're going to see some incredible companies. And all of us as investors are going to have to go back to, I remember early in my career learning SaaS metrics from perpetual license. And now I'm like going back into an old file to find perpetual license best practices and metrics because we're, we're going back to that a little bit. Um, so that's something I'm really excited about that probably isn't fully accepted. I think um, I would give two. I think the first one would be Web3. I don't think Web3 is dead. Uh, and that might not be as big of a hot take, but just how to put it out there. And I think the second one uh, that might be more of a hot take, uh, and I love that visual of if I were in front of my friends or in front of investors and I pitch this idea, they'd be like, absolutely not. Um, I'm going to pull it out of the AI cloud world for a second, which is what uh, I think Elliot and I are in all day long. But um, for me, I, I think consumer. It's specifically consumer products that are being built for um, just other demographics, I think, are still super needed. I, I feel like folks maybe shy away from those investments right now. Maybe some argue they're not necessarily venture backable, but I do think that there is a lot of need still, specifically for products that cater towards communities that may not be at the forefront, right? Um, myself, I am constantly looking for new curly hair products regularly. I am testing, trying things out. Uh, it's literally my. I think Natalie in the room over there, a friend of mine, uh, knows me for a while and can uh, confirm that statement. But I think it's super important that we think about some of those communities that may not necessarily still have products available to them to wake up and go in the morning, right? Um, have their curly hair just out and about and do their thing. So, The Lord is my barber, so I'm always <laughs> looking for, as a, as a bald man of color, I, I can't... Um, you I need can't products change. too. You need yeah, products too. Yeah, like I can't too. go in a uh, Dwayne Reed and That's what's true. use the Bic and it's like the spray thing. stuff. It's a different thing. So I'm with you. Don't forget about us, though. You I know? will. Please make a T-shirt. That's so amazing. Yeah. Want to share quickly? Um, uh, it's funny. I mean, because we invest globally, uh, we a lot of people ask us, "How do you do?" Like, for instance, Nigeria or like some other countries, and I and I often have to argue um, around how we manage geopolitical risk or currency risk, and there's all this concern around it. Um, but yet, when you think about the banks that failed most recently, most of them were here in the US. And so um, <laughs> it's, 
that is one where I find I feel like I'm always fighting that fight. But I think there's just so much opportunity in a country that has 250 million people, and they still can't even um, pay for Ubers with uh, credit cards. They're paying with cash for most of their Ubers, and they're paying their rent 12 months in advance. And farmers are still driving 25 kilometers to the bank to deposit their cash. There's so much opportunity, right? And so. Ashley, do you want to quickly? Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't mean to be doomsday, but this is my healthcare hat on. Um, I'm thinking a lot about like bioterrorism and bio threat, and how this country is not. I know, I know. This country's not prepared. She says with a smile. <laughs> oh, boy. I'm not evil. I promise. Um, I don't have th something up my sleeve. <laughs> um, but uh, how this country isn't prepared. It's so fragmented and inefficient. We all know how the healthcare system is, and something like smallpox running around. Right. This is where technology is really interesting and capacity and planning and medical delivery and crisis management. And so that's something that I'm thinking about a lot. Elliot, welcome to New York. So we got this going on for us. Welcome. Uh, all right, so last question before we wrap this up and get some drinks. It's a fun question. We like to end it off a little fun. Uh, Elon versus Zuck. Everybody sees this in the news. I think this was this was the most uh, popular question that was submitted. So Twitter versus that. Threads. I, I have an opinion, which we'll share. But uh, do you think Zuckerberg's threads will be able to stand up to Twitter long term, share any more predictions between the two, hot takes, whatever you got. Sam, what do you think? Oh, I got a take. Oh, go for it. I was, I'm ready. You ready? Let's go. Go ahead. So for those of us of certain communities, um, the sauce on social media resides here. <laughs> um, and my way of answering that question is uh, I'm a very early first investor in a company called Spill. I was gonna shout out Spill. Shout out Spill. Well, Damn. too late. <laughs> um, so Do you have I it downloaded? That win. Yeah, of course, oh, come on. Shit. All right. So I think of it not the battle between Elon and Zuck, but really the battle between Elon, Zuck, and Fonz. I should've went first. Um, because if you see where the sauce is going, for those that know what the sauce is, it's going to a place, and now it's gonna be like, you know, crypto bro threads and whatever's left. Like, I'll, good luck. Like, I, it's a great business. It's just not where, like, the future of social is going. Um, so it's not just about spill. Obviously, I'm an investor. I'm incentivized. But there's, like, like community-specific social that's happening uh, in a way that we haven't seen before. So, you know, I'll leave it to the big corporations to fight over, like, who has the biggest, baddest, whatever, download numbers, who cares? I want to know where the sauce is, and that's where I'm going to So go. we need to download this Spill app is what you're saying? A hundred percent. Okay. Okay. And I'm not an investor. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I can't disagree, Charlie. I'm sorry. But yes, Spill, uh, I'd say maybe a small nuanced difference in what Elliot said is that perhaps Threads is not the competition for Twitter, but I think Threads is indeed highlighting um, you know, a pain point that Twitter currently has because of the changes that Twitter is going through, right? I think Threads is at minimum creating a, a public awareness around some of the you know, sore spots that Twitter is currently experiencing and opening up perhaps more opportunity for other players in the game like Spill to hopefully have more brand awareness and build their own um, you know, usership in the way that Threads did overnight because of Instagram. I also don't think Threads is going to move the needle much because I do think we're in a world of conscious consumerism and I, I'd like to think that people are hesitant to give Facebook another uh, control lever on the social media space. So that's my, my add-on. Okay. So before I open up the voting, I, I just will show this, this nice slide that Sam put together here. At the bottom is the Twitter threads for everybody here. Their Twitter handles. <laughs> Well, You're right. the value is VC. My, my spill. I still use Twitter, yeah. so I, yeah, I see yeah. you on there. It's don't nice. don't like. I have three handles on Spill because it's less professional there. So I'm not gonna <laughs> put my Spill handle out here, but um, I'm gonna put up. We follow Twitter. each other. I'll follow I'm gonna put up the QR code, and we didn't use this, but I want to throw it. So it's for anybody who's got a question while we're voting. I want to throw this at you, and you're gonna ask a question. It might hurt. I, don't, oh, it's I was hoping someone in the back. He has a question. Right? Sorry, hold it. Here we go. No, that's all right. Uh, well, first of all, thank you. Yeah, all. Speaking to the uh, the box. I think oh, it's, it's a speaker. A microphone. Oh, that's cool. Cool. It, oh red, red one. Red one. Is, sorry. Got it. Get a good toss in there. There we go. You this? So, first off, thank you very much for the insight and expertise. Uh, it's been great listening to everybody. My question is, what's the most effective way for founders, particularly diverse founders, 
who don't have a deep investor network to start building those relationships and cut through the clutter because I'm sure you guys are getting bombarded all the time. I can take this one. Um, I'd say it's a couple of things. I think the first one is coming to events like these, right? Looking out for ways to network, build your network. Um, hate that answer, but it is the reality. So I think that's the first thing. Look for your advocates, right? Would be my my second thing. Um, and I think that perhaps the third piece of it too would be, um, you know, figure out ways to also get free money as you're building too, right? And I think this goes for any kind, any diverse founders, all founders in general, bef you know, really try and get as much free money as possible before um, seeking investors. And I, I think that once you get an understanding of what you're building, what it looks like, maybe a better understanding of your, your product market fit, or in some cases people are talking about a problem market fit, which I think is also an interesting perspective too. Um, you'll have an understanding of what kind of investors you should be talking to, right? Like even founders that I know that are building things, like even our recipients of the funds, you know, they'll say, hey, I want to meet so-and-so investor, or we want to pitch them. And my question back to them is, why is this investor important for you? Why does this firm's mission align with what you're building? And, and really understanding that, I think, comes from having a bit more understanding of your own product market fit, too. So, I'll keep it brief. I'll tell you one thing not to do and one thing to do. Uh, stay away from LinkedIn inbox. Like, yes. It's just the worst way to reach out. Because people like write to you as if they know you, because like they pay the whatever fee it is to like send you stuff. Like it's just a zero. Uh, so save your time. Um, what to do uh, is use that save time to actually know who you're reaching out to. The number of copy paste emails I get that have someone else's name in it, some other firm in the email, or literally have <laughs> really? yes. no idea. I mean, I don't do. I'm not cool enough to do consumer like clothing, brands, anything, it's just not me. But the number of people that reach out and say, hi, Elliot with one L and two Ts, I know you're really big into consumer, direct to consumer brand. And I'm like, I've never done one in my life, so now that's deleted. <laughs> but like someone spent time doing that. Like just spend the time being intentional about what funds, what particular investors, and like the ROI of just curating 20 outreaches, you'll probably get a 30% response rate versus copy pasting and sending 150 and no one will email you back and then you'll end up hating the process. Yes. Oh, you go. I have one more thing to add. But... No, I, I would say two things too. I think one, um, to your point, like humans, investors are humans. Humans like flattery. So what article did you read or what LinkedIn post did they post or something that like catches their attention, right? I mean, I like it too. And Charlie says, oh, Jason had a quote on his LinkedIn, and this is the quote about a book. And I'm like, oh, Charlie's been looking at, looking at my LinkedIn. So it creates some sort of connection, right? But then secondarily, I think underrepresented founders generally aren't as audacious as, as represented founders. I, don't know. I, was, I was struggling, too. <laughs> I was, like, I what was is struggling. The word? Um, and I think um, I just always encourage my founders, like, if you don't ask or if you aren't bold with that ask or if you aren't um, – audacious and kind of courageous with it, someone else is gonna get that meeting, someone else is gonna get that. I did lunch today with someone that just like emailed me three times asking, can I take you to lunch? And I was like, okay, fine, let's go to lunch. <laughs> and so I think just being audacious and bold because someone's gonna get that time or someone's gonna get that response. Um, and I don't think underrepresented founders tend to be as, as bold about it. Mm -hmm. I would say have, have the ask, have the ask for your peers, your fellow founders, because they might know, right? other founders, investors, angels, strategics, what have you. And even go and like do research on the portfolio companies of your dream investor that you've done research on and reach out to those founders. I think a lot of times founders don't do as much research on us as we do on them. And that alignment is so important. Agreed. And I, I think the last thing I'll say too, and I'm curious if anyone disagrees with me on this panel about this statement, but um, doesn't necessarily always have to be an ask right away. I think there's something to be said about starting the relationship even before you are looking for an investment. Just even if it's a, hey, I saw you wrote this article. I just wanted to say hi. I know you're talking to a million other founders and then running away. Um, I think that little relationship building you know, options or, or opportunities rather um, are super powerful. It's, it's really kind of like dating, right? You kind of just start off first, say hi, and then before you have the ask, you've already met this person a couple of times or had a coffee chat or what have you before the ask even came about. Yeah, I can't think of any investment I've done where they were asking for money the very first time I met them. Um, and so I agree. Before we show the results and who the winner is, uh, I just want to say thank you to the production team. That's been so helpful. Woo. Awesome. Yes. You guys are staying a couple extra minutes. We appreciate that. Um, Mel, do you want to 
do the results here. There we go. Elliot. Elliot with the win. Elliot with the win. Elliot, take your title belt. Woo. Give your uh, speech. Woo. Well, I take a uh, 30 second speech or something like that. Yeah, so I. Um, so this is what yours. am I supposed to do? You can walk up here. This is I, do this. You know, you walk. That's around. not the vibe. All right. let's, let's, let's let's keep it's it. All right. cool. um, I'm going to use this time to talk about the thing that's most passionate um, for me personally, uh, and that's about values, particularly in the startup and venture capital ecosystem. Obviously, it's something I talk about a lot, um, and I'm going to pair that with something that I talk about a lot, which is cultural fit mm -hmm. and the need to get rid of that as a construct. So we're sitting in a really big corporation that's trying to go through its own like changes, but we're also living in this moment in time where when macroeconomic forces change, DE&I stuff starts to like slide to the back. And for those of us who have seen these moment in times happen again and again and again, it's really up to all of us, whether it's in your venture fund, your startup, your corporation, whatever it is that you do, to do your best to root out cultural fit. I don't fit in venture capital. I wear J's to work every day. It's a better shoe than Allbirds. It's a trash shoe, this Allbirds thing. I apologize. I agree. <laughs> and they're Warren alum, and I still. They're awful shoes. Um, <laughs> and, and the reason why I mention that is I bring my whole self to work every day. And when I hire and scale my team and talk to folks at my firm and my portfolio companies, the whole idea is can we define our values? hire, train, and develop around those core values, take cultural fit, get that out, and now we score people on cultural add. How do you add and expand the fabric inside of your corporation, your startup, your venture fund, your production company? And if we do that, we'll all look back at the end of our careers and feel like we pushed the ball forward. So um, that's kind of like my closing perspective. All right, can you give it up for these guys? Thanks, guys.